In our last episode, we talked about Gauguin trying to paint creatively by painting from memory while dreaming about the abstraction of nature. Besides forming his style, his paintings from Martinique also brought him to Theo, Van Gogh's brother. In one occasion, Theo bought this painting for 400 francs and the drawing. Van Gogh made some exchanges. This was significant even for Gauguin because Theo was a managing art dealer of a leading Paris gallery. At the end of the summer, Theo, now as Gauguin's dealer, sold 300 francs of Gauguin's pottery and offered Gauguin 150 francs a month for 12 paintings a year. That was 150 francs per painting. On top of that, Theo would pay Gauguin's debt and travel expenses to Arles to paint with Van Gogh. Gauguin was suspicious that the general's offer was just an enticement to get him to go to Arles to be with Van Gogh. But why not? He left for Arles anyway in October. Here we're talking about a couple of thousand francs a year. It sounded to Gauguin as something too good to be true. Remember, he was making 30,000 francs a year before. Now in Arles, painting with Van Gogh, Gauguin advised Van Gogh to paint for memory and imagination. That suggestion impacted Van Gogh's painting enormously. But the relationship of the two was uneasy. They fought almost constantly, from the purpose of art to the most petty stuff of living together. Van Gogh at one time threw a drink at Gauguin in a bar. Finally, in the evening of December 23, 1888, after a fight, Gauguin told Van Gogh that he was leaving for Paris. Van Gogh ended up cutting off part of his own ear and sent it to a prostitute. Van Gogh was hospitalized and Gauguin left for Paris. They were together for only 63 days at the Yellow House, shown here. Obviously, the arguments did not hinder their paintings. Gauguin made 21 paintings and Van Gogh 36. They never saw each other again although continued writing to each other. Gauguin did this one in Arles. Thick paint was applied directly onto raw canvas. In this primitive fashion, Gauguin portrayed these deeply religious peasants. The image is so flat that I'm not even sure what some of the geometric landscape objects represented. We see that by the time he visited Arles, his style has matured. This brave man, not afraid of going anywhere in search of that idea that pleased him, finally got what he had been looking for. If newness was what he wanted, he certainly did it the right way by going to places that none of his Paris friends would go. This one is called Be in Love and You Will Be Happy. We see the happy Gauguin at the upper right-hand corner. Holding her hand is a demon. Gauguin often contrasted good and evil this way. Maybe this is another reason why people labeled Gauguin a symbolist. The fox probably represented the forces of temptation. Tempted, Gauguin certainly was. We have seen similar innuendos in Manet's Olympia, so this is not new. Ever a venturous soul, Gauguin wanted to give Tahiti a try in 1890 after reading a novel about it. After a successful auction in February 1891, plus some additional fundraising events, he got sufficient fund. First, he went to Copenhagen to see his wife, the last time that the two would meet, before setting sail in April, arriving in June. With the image of paradise in mind, what did he find? Let me quote Gauguin. Was I to have made this far journey only to find the very thing which I had fled. The dream which had brought me to Tahiti was brutally disappointed by the actuality. It was the Tahiti of former times which I loved. In view of the persistent physical beauty of the race, it seemed unbelievable that all its ancient grandeur, its personal and natural customs, its beliefs, and its legends had disappeared. But how was I, all by myself, to find the traces of this past? If any such traces remained, 
How was I to recognize them without any guidance? How to relight the fire, the very ashes of which are scattered? Despite the destruction by the French colonization, Gauguin put himself to the task of painting the Tahiti in his mind. So, with his mature style and several descriptive books, he set out to invent the Tahiti that he came to see. Here is the product. Here is another one. I'm not going to try to pronounce her name. The first one is how Gauguin called her in his travelogue. In the bracket is how she was called natively. He married her when she was 13 and had a child with her. When he left Tahiti in July of 1893, he left her there. When he returned to the island later, he did not go to see her or the child. Back to Paris, he expected success. In November, he exhibited 40 paintings at high prices. Only 11 were sold. Trying to enhance his exotic image, Gauguin made outlandish remarks and had an open affair with a teenager who was half Indian, half Malayan, known as Anna the Javanese. The theatrics did not work. To the Paris crowd, his behavior was rather distasteful than exotic. His woodcut travelogue titled Noah Noah, as shown here, did not work either. His trip to Pontavan turned up nothing. His wife tried to terminate the relationship. Before long, he burned through his cash. With nothing working and seeing himself quickly becoming a total reject, by 1895 he wanted to raise funds to go back to Tahiti. Even. The fundraising effort failed. Finally, in June, Eugene Carrier, an artist and a friend, got him a cheap ticket to Tahiti. Gauguin will never see Europe again. We will continue with the final chapter of Gauguin's life in the next episode. I'll see you then.